morning. I'm, he said I'm a photographer, but I'm hoping to share a couple of photos, maybe, uh, with the audience. Um, I am a Muslim, Queens, New Yorker, hip-hop loving, Syrian American. And all four of those things make up who I am, unapologetically. Islam gave me the foundation, not of what I could and couldn't do, but what I should and shouldn't do. Queens, New York gave me the confidence to not care about anything. <laughs> Hip hop, the culture of excellence, the culture of being the best, the culture of pushing the boundaries and trying to be at the top of your game. Damascus, Syria, where my mother and father were born, gave me the Syrian Arabic language and the foundation of my morals that I would carry for the rest of my life. And none of that mattered. At least to me, it didn't. It didn't matter because that's just who I was. And I never really thought about it until 2001. On that faithful day, I watched from our 14th floor apartment balcony as the smoke billowed into the sky. My skyline was bleeding. My skyline, not anybody else's, mine, my skyline. Little did I know that that part would be ignored and I would be questioned about so many other things and we would have to explain so much more. As an artist, I graduated college and started to explore that identity of what it means to be an artist, try to complete yourself as a person. So I would link up with other minorities other Arab Americans, other Muslim Americans, to try to figure out who are we? What are we doing here? Our biggest challenge is us, and our highest mountain is the one we build for ourselves and the com competition we have against who we're trying to be. Not who the media is setting you up to be or who, who the media is telling you to, who to be. So is it what somebody else says you are that defines you, or is it what you say about yourself that defines you? I was approached by a Muslim magazine in 2007 to create some covers for them. And this image was born. This image, at the time, was a simple statement using two symbols, hijab, clearly identifiable as Muslim, the headscarf, and the American flag. What's more American than the American flag? Symbols that were instantly recognizable to make a statement that I, I'm an American. That's it. Nothing else. I remember I went with Munira Ahmed, a Bangladeshi, also Queens, New Yorker, down to ground zero to take the image because it was that much more important to do it there. I remember as people passed by, they would give us some interesting looks to say the least. And ironically enough, in the background, we are right next to the tower of he who shall not be named. And over the convening years, <laughs> and over the next years, I began to develop that identity more as an artist and explore more about who we are as Muslim Americans, as citizens, as artists. What are we doing here? What are we trying to accomplish? What's the message that we're trying to get across? Poets, painters, spoken word artists, comedians, all facets of the Muslim American community to try to kind of come up with who we are and what are we doing here. And beyond that, what is America? Who has the right to define what America is and isn't? I don't. I have my version. Everybody has their own version. And that's the beauty of America, that mixture of all of us that makes up America. And honestly, I was tired and sick of making the statement, tired and sick of having to explain anything, until in 2016, it became relevant again. This image had been used in the Muslim community, and it was important that it came from the Muslim community and served that community for years. They would unofficially use it on everything, posters, flyers, events, with my permission, without. But I was approached by Amplifier Foundation and Shepard Ferry, and this image was born. They approached me to do a campaign 
that would take all those marginalized during that election season, and they would take the imagery of Daphne Diallo and Arlene Maharado, and he would also remix these images to create these, Shepard Fairy Wood, along with Ernesto Yonera, Aysan Gerzen, and Jessica Sabogal, the We the People campaign was born. For me, it wasn't a campaign against anything. It was a campaign pro all those things and all those people. I don't have to answer to anybody. I'm just here to bring my own people up and bring those who are forgotten up. And on Inauguration Day, those images would grace the, the back covers of the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the USA Today. I remember that day walking into a 7-Eleven and picking up the newspapers and going to pay for them. There was a Latin American woman behind the counter. I showed her proudly. I was like, that's, that's mine. <laughs> but then I opened up the Latina cover and I said, and that's yours. And the look on her face brought tears to my eyes because I knew that's why we were doing what we were doing. The next day would be the Women's March in Washington, D.C., and I would go to witness what was created and how it was touching people, young and old, black and white. I would hand them my business card, and it had my image on it, and people would be like, can I take your picture? I wasn't the important one. All different races, all different ethnicities, you could see how they were connecting to the imagery, connecting to the messaging. It would go on to be one of the largest Kickstarter campaigns in the art column. I would even take my daughter to the Women's March so she could witness it firsthand, and so she could experience it, so that she could see the impact of the image and the impact of all the talk that I've been talking about for so long. I would meet a married couple that had it printed on their shirts as we ate lunch. They sat in the table right behind us and didn't even know it. So I walked up and I introduced myself and they, they were extremely excited and wanted to know the story behind it. Over the next coming months and weeks, we would get images from all over, all over the world. People sending me, tagging me in images, sending me images, showing me how people were using it and remixing it and putting out their own versions of it. People would draw their own. People would make their own representations using it. It would be on bread. <laughs> I never thought that any of my images would become bread. <laughs> and even 2,000 pieces of Lego, and I love Lego, so when I saw this, I lost my mind. Even be tattooed on somebody's body. And just last week, it would make it on a flag to the top of Mount Everest. It would be downloaded in over 205 countries around the world. And my image in particular would be downloaded over 350,000 times. All this from an image that was created 10 years ago. So in this modern day of instant fame and instant forgotten, we don't know when or who we're going to touch with what we create. We're all trying to get that instant gratification we put things out and we hope that somebody reacts and clicks like. And we're gonna have some critics. And the biggest critic of all was my own daughter, who when all this was happening, goes to me, what's the big deal, it's just a photo. My photo's cooler. <laughs> and yes, while I do love this photo for other reasons, I say to her, and I say to all artists, and anybody creating anything, create from the heart, and you will reach others' hearts, no matter how long it takes. Thank you.